We are here today to announce the results of the investigation into whether the Portland Police Bureau engages in a pattern and practice of excessive force that violates the Constitution of the United States. The investigation began in June of 2011 and was jointly conducted by my office and the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice. What we have found is that the Portland Police Bureau does, in fact, engage in a pattern and practice of an excessive use of force, specifically in its dealings with people who suffer from mental illness or people who are experiencing a mental health crisis, and that this pattern or practice does violate the Constitution of the United States. This has been tough. I have the utmost respect for the men and the women in the Portland Police Bureau who put their lives on the line in the name of public safety every day. These findings don't change the fact that this is one of the finest investigative police agencies in the nation. As a United States Attorney for the District of Oregon, I am proud to work with the men and women in the Portland Police Bureau and to have their partnership on so many important complex cases that are handled in the United States Attorney's Office, from gangs and drugs to terrorism and national security. These are grave and serious findings and they must be understood within some broader context. First, the vast majority of the uses of force that the Portland Police Bureau engage in are appropriate and within constitutional limits. Second, these findings come in the context of another investigation that was opened in the fall of 2010, which examined Oregon's failure to deliver adequate services to people suffering from mental illness. We identified large gaps in the state's mental health system, including people who are in crisis. Those gaps are currently being addressed through provisions put in place as part of Governor Kitzhaber's health care transformation, and we are continuing to monitor compliance with agreed upon metrics as that transformation is rolled out. At the same time, the findings against the Portland Police Bureau lay the framework for us to make meaningful changes that will not only make us safer, but will empower Portland's police officers to be more effective as trusted public servants. In fact, this week when we examined, when we explained the findings to the chief and the mayor, they immediately asked, where do we go from here? I think to some extent the people from DC were a little surprised, but I wasn't, because that's how we roll in Portland. I want to thank Tom Perez for understanding that different communities call for different approaches and for empowering us and his team to create some preliminary agreements that are going to inform the process moving forward. At one point when I was talking to Tom on the phone after meetings with the chief and the mayor, and I said, I really think we can make some meaningful progress towards what it might look like in the future for us to implement some reforms. He thought for a minute and he said, yeah, I guess sometimes you've got to call an audible. And I told him in Oregon, we're all about the no-puddle offense. <laughs> and I know that the chief and the mayor and the city attorney, my office, and the team from Civil Rights, along with the community and the people of the city of Portland, are going to continue to move that ball down the field as we look for a better way to do things in Portland. We all agree with the fundamental principle that all citizens, and especially our most vulnerable, must be able to trust the police to protect their civil rights. In the coming days and weeks, I'll be meeting with community groups, along with people from the team from the Civil Rights Division, throughout Portland to hear your concerns and your ideas about what you think we need to have as part of the solution moving forward. We have great momentum on which to build, and there's no city in America with a better track record of working together to find real solutions to problems such as these. Finally, I want to say that I acknowledge that police officers have one of the most difficult jobs in the world. They are sworn to serve and protect and to uphold the constitutions of both the state of Oregon and the United States. These findings highlight where there has been a breakdown in that solemn vow. But more importantly, they signal an opportunity, a chance to work together to lead the way in implementing reforms that will ensure that our most vulnerable citizens are protected and served. I'm confident that we will be successful, and the man who is the main reason for my optimism that we couldn't is that is Chief Reese because we couldn't have a more committed partner and a more committed change agent in the state of Oregon to carry out these reforms, which I believe will be a model for the rest of the nation. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good morning. My name is Tom Perez. I am the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, it is uh, uh, an honor to be back here in Portland and to join uh, Mayor Adams, Chief Reese, and my colleague, uh, United States Attorney Amanda Marshall, uh, to report on the results of our investigation of the Portland uh, Police Bureau and to uh, discuss the road ahead. Uh, civil rights enforcement at a federal level is always a joint venture between uh, the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division and the United States Attorney's offices across the country, and I am uh, very honored to have uh, Amanda Marshall as a wonderful partner and the dedicated career staff uh, in her office, and I'm equally uh, blessed with the uh, wonderful career staff here in the Civil Rights Division, and I want to thank all of them for their hard work, and I also want to thank uh, Chief Reese and Mayor Adams for your remarkable uh, collaboration. And I'm very, very pleased to announce that uh, while we have indeed identified uh, serious deficiencies in the use of force context, we have also reached a preliminary agreement on the road forward, a road forward that will improve the ability to protect public safety and to ensure that uh, the Constitution is indeed respected. And uh, throughout, as Amanda Marshall pointed out, uh, the mayor and the chief uh, have been extremely cooperative. When we announced our investigation, uh, Chief Reese observed that this is a, quote, a unique opportunity to be at the forefront of best practices. Uh, Chief, you correctly noted that Portland is not the only city that is addressing the difficult issue of providing police services to people with mental illness. Uh, mayor, when we met and we announced this back in June of last year, you noted that you were, quote, humbled in the knowledge that we haven't figured it all out. Uh, and I appreciate that uh, spirit in which you approached the investigation. You both had an understandable and very well-founded pride in your department, and you pledged your uh, total cooperation. Uh, they have delivered on that pledge and were consistently responsive to our document requests. They maintained an open door and an open file policy throughout our site visits, and have been very receptive uh, to our feedback. They have not waited for a report to implement reform. The reform process uh, has been ongoing. I would also like to thank the frontline officers in the Portland Police Bureau for their cooperation and feedback. Our job is to make your job safer and more rewarding. Finally, I'd like to thank the community. We have spent a lot of time in the community. We held a town hall meeting. We conducted dozens and dozens of interviews. We listened and learned from so many community members your perspective was absolutely indispensable and continues to be critical, and we will continue to seek your views. As a result of the cooperation that we received throughout the investigation, we made remarkable progress in record time. As the United States Attorney pointed out, we have completed our review, we have diagnosed the problem, identified its root causes, and reached a preliminary agreement with the city of Portland and the Portland Police Bureau, which will remedy the problems and enhance both officer safety and public safety while allowing the Police Bureau to, in your words, uh, Chief Reese, be at the forefront of best practices. Uh, as the United States Attorney outlined, we've been at this for over a year and our focus has been on use of force issues with a particular focus on interactions with people with mental illness or in mental health crisis. Our review was prompted by the high number of officer-involved shootings of people with mental illness. The investigation was driven by a single goal, to ensure that Portland is served by an effective, accountable uh, police bureau that controls crime, respects the Constitution, and enjoys the trust of the public that it protects. Our investigation was exhaustive, and it was conducted by department attorneys, investigators, and subject matter experts, including a police practices expert, including a psychiatrist who specializes in working with law enforcement agencies to develop models for effective interaction with people who have mental illness. We conducted a thorough review of use of force by uh, PPB officers, which included reviewing thousands of pages of documents and conducting its extensive outreach to the community through hundreds of interviews that I've outlined. We looked at a range of police interactions, including encounters with people who have mental illness or are perceived to have mental illness. And let me focus for a moment on the problem we identified. Based on our review, we concluded that while most uses of force were lawful, and let me underscore, while most uses of force were lawful, there is reasonable cause to believe that PPB is engaged in a pattern or practice of using excessive force against people with mental illness 
or those perceived to have mental illness. We found that encounters between uh, PPB officers and persons living with mental illness too frequently result in the unnecessary use of force or in a higher level of force that was necessary. We further found that when dealing with people who have mental illness, uh, PPB officers use electronic control weapons or tasers in circumstances where the use of tasers was not justified or they deploy them more times than is necessary. Finally, in situations where PPB officers arrest people with mental illness for low-level offenses, we found that there is a pattern or practice of using more force than necessary in these circumstances. It is important, indeed imperative, I believe, to reiterate that the challenges we identified here in Portland are not unique to Portland. Police work has transformed dramatically in recent years. I remember vividly uh, a Portland police officer who described how uh, years ago encounters with people who have mental illness were few and far between. Today, that person pointed out, it is a daily occurrence for most officers and oftentimes it is uh, occurring more than once per day. Communities across the country are wrestling with how to deliver effective police services and public safety services to people with mental illness. We have seen and are working with these with other communities on these very issues and believe that the work we do here in Portland will serve as an important guidepost for communities facing similar challenges. Let me turn to root causes. We conclude that the deficiencies in policy, training, and supervision contribute to the problems that we identified. These underlying deficiencies have existed for many years and precede the tenure of Mayor Adams and Chief Reese. While they have not created the problem, they own the problem, and they have indeed accepted ownership of both the problems and the solutions that lie ahead. And as U.S. Attorney Marshall correctly pointed out, they have wasted no time in beginning the process of improvement. A number of critical improvements are already in place. When we presented our findings to them, we immediately pivoted to the brainstorming and problem-solving phase. And we are indeed able to announce that we have reached a preliminary agreement with the city and the PPB about the path forward. We have developed a blueprint for sustainable reform that will enhance public and officer safety, ensure constitutional policing, and enhance public confidence in PPB. The blueprint, which we are in the process of memorializing into a binding court enforceable agreement, will require PPB to do the following. To develop state-of-the-art policies and protocols for interacting with people who have mental illness or are perceived to have mental illness, to dramatically expand its capacity to serve, provide services to people with mental illness by expanding its mobile crisis unit, establishing a mental health desk at the Bureau of Emergency Services so that 911 calls are properly funneled to the appropriate response team, and assist in leading efforts to increase community mental health treatment options, such as 24-hour walk-in centers and other facilities that expand options for police officers seeking to assist a person who is experiencing a mental health crisis. We will revamp and expand training related to crisis intervention and use of force. Enhance usage of its early warning system to better identify officers whose actions may require further review. To ensure that effective supervisory and accountability systems are in place to review the use of force. And finally, to create a mechanism for ensuring that community stakeholders and frontline officers have a meaningful opportunity to weigh in on critical improvements. Before we finalize any agreement, we are going back to the community to hear again from them and to hear from other critical stakeholders, including police officers. I had the opportunity and indeed the privilege of meeting with senior command staff this morning to begin that conversation, and these conversations will be continuing. And to all those who have weighed in during this process, I recognize that this is your agreement this is your department, this is your community, and we want to continue to ensure that your voice is heard. I am very excited about this blueprint and look forward to hearing the feedback from key stakeholders in the days and weeks ahead, because our goal is indeed to complete our work in the next month. And I am acutely mindful of the fact that this agreement alone will not solve the problem in its entirety. Our findings take place against the backdrop of a statewide mental health infrastructure that has a number of key deficiencies. The absence of a comprehensive community-based mental health infrastructure means that frontline officers confronting a person experiencing a mental health crisis 
frequently have only two options, take the person to jail or take the person to the emergency room. In communities across this country, the largest mental health facility is the jail. That's wrong, and we need to change that, and we need to improve that as a nation. And the largest mental health facility in a state or county should not be the jail. Officers must have additional options, and people in crisis must have additional options. We have worked successfully in other states, such as Delaware, to build a community, a comprehensive community-based mental health infrastructure. As U.S. Attorney Marshall mentioned, we are working here in Oregon with state officials in a very collaborative fashion on the development and implementation of a holistic community-based mental health infrastructure that will indeed, when implemented, enhance both officer safety and public safety and provide those options, those critical options, for people who are in mental health crisis. Our formal findings uh, in this case are focused, as we have discussed, on uh, PPB's interaction with people who have mental illness. And while the bulk of our investigation focused on this area, it was not limited to this area. A number of additional concerns were brought to our attention by community members. And while we did not make any formal findings regarding these additional issues, it is impossible to ignore the tensions that exist between PPB and certain communities of color here in Portland. Last year, uh, Mayor Adams noted that one reason he welcomed our presence in the community was that he hoped that it would help to lead to improved relationships between PPB and Portland's communities of color. And he has made this a very strong priority, and as has the chief. We have heard consistent and serious concerns from across the community that uh, it's, and, and, and I would note that our, our, we had many conversations with uh, people in the African American community who felt that they were subject to bias stops and, and uses of force that were based on their race. And I would note that while these, these tensions uh, long predate Chief uh, Reese's tenure and Mayor Adams' tenure, they persist in many corners of this community uh, to this day. And our agreement, the preliminary agreement that I've outlined, will begin to address these important issues in two ways. First of all, uh, the new policies, procedures, training, and accountability surrounding force will help ensure that unnecessary and unreasonable force is eliminated, plain and simple. And secondly, a community body will be created to help with this agreement and its implementation, to collect feedback from the community, and to provide recommendations to PPB. The mechanism for community engagement and input that we are creating as part of this agreement will not be limited to mental health issues. Rather, uh, it is deliberately designed to create an opportunity for dialogue and action between uh, PPB and communities of color. And that dialogue has already begun, but we recognize, and the chief and the mayor recognize, that we can and must do more. And so I recognize in moving forward, um, while I am very excited that we have made so much progress in such a short time, we recognize fully that considerable work lies ahead. Change is not easy. Change requires time, it requires persistence, partnership, a sound plan, resources, effective leadership, and sustained community engagement. And the reason I come here today with a deep reservoir of optimism is that all of these ingredients, all of them, are here in Portland. I've been around the country. I've seen communities working together with law enforcement to build better models of effective policing. And you indeed have all of these ingredients of progress here in Portland, and you have indeed made progress. And I am very confident that we will, in fact, working together. And the we is not simply the Department of Justice and city officials. The we is everybody, the community, because we're all in this together. And we will achieve the goal that Chief Reese has outlined of placing the Portland Police Bureau at the forefront of best practices. This is a great community. I see that immediately every time I come. And when these improvements are fully in place, a great community will become even better. I have great confidence in that. And with that, I will uh, turn it over uh, to the mayor. Thank you very much. Good morning, I'm Sam Adams. I'm the police commissioner for the city of Portland. Two years ago, community leaders, Commissioner Dan Saltzman and myself, asked the U.S. Department of Justice Civil Rights Division to review the Portland Police Bureau for bias, regardless of whether or not it was intentional, unconscious, 
or institutional bias, any kind of bias. During this federal investigation, we sought to open our books, our doors, and our minds. Yesterday, we received the 42-page letter detailing the findings of this 14-month investigation. It includes, as you've heard, a critique of our financially starved, community-based mental health system. It states, uh, it states one of our key findings takes place against the backdrop of a mental health infrastructure that has a key number of deficiencies with insufficient options for adequate community-based mental health services, quote unquote. Given our anemic community-based mental health system, I appreciate that the findings note that the already tough job of being a Portland police officer has gotten even tougher with these conditions and with situations that often, again, quoting from the findings, shifts the law enforcement agencies the burden of being the first responders to individuals in mental health crisis. In my last budget, it is because of the mental health system crisis that a key reason why I did not cut sworn police officers and did not cut sworn firefighter positions, even though we had to make significant cuts from the city's budget. And I too want to add my thanks to the hardworking officers of the Portland Police Bureau for working in a very tough situation. I am pleased that the finding states that, quote, most uses of force we reviewed were constitutional, and that, quote, many of the systemic deficiencies discussed in the letter originated prior to the current PPB administration. And I agree that we have an improvement-minded chief of police that is very well situated, along with his management team and this Portland Police Bureau, to move forward on solutions. But the findings, as you heard, are also very blunt in their assessment that we get a failing grade for dealing with the growing number of Portlanders who face serious mental health issues. We occasionally use, quote, unnecessary and unreasonable force during interactions with people who have or are perceived to have mental illness. Without defensiveness or finger pointing, we all need to absorb the seriousness of this critique and urgent need is change. Urgent need for change. We all need to take our portion of the responsibility to improve the situation. And as police commissioner, I intend to do my part. We will improve and we will begin to do it quickly. Some needed changes have already been put in place as we have learned through the questions and the dialogue uh, with the great team of the Civil Rights Division and the U.S. Attorney's Office. And I want to thank you and your teams for the great work that you've brought uh, to this effort and for bringing the uh, expertise uh, from around the nation. Um, this is really an amazing opportunity for us. Some of the work that is already underway is, for example, the new Police Training Center and uh, Training Citizen Advisory Council that was included in this year's budget. Uh, success in some of the most diverse recruitment classes in the history of the Portland Police Bureau drug testing and officer evaluations, either in place or underway. And as you've heard from the Assistant Attorney General, agreement on a letter of intent to move forward to make improvements around the use of force, crisis intervention, early intervention system uh, for employees, misconduct investigations, and community engagement and outreach. These reforms will require new resources but together they will propel the Portland Police Bureau further down the path as it becomes the best local law enforcement and peacekeeping agency in the nation. You might ask how we can move so quickly uh, in 30 days to come up with meaningful programs and reforms. And I would ask that Commissioner Amanda Fritz join me very briefly, if I might. If I, might. Um, I assign Commissioner Fritz uh, the issue of looking uh, at through Safer PDX, that includes providers, police, um, a whole host of partners uh, focused on this issue. They have been focused on this issue and looking at solutions for the past three years, and I'd like her to just touch on 
our ability to move quickly into solutions is because of the benefit of the Bazelon project and Safer PDX, Commissioner Amanda Fritz. I'm really pleased with this uh, statement of intent and the settlement approach and thank my fellow members of the Safer PDX project and particularly Dr. Maggie Bennett from Davis, the med Chief Medical Officer of Cascadia Behavioral Health who has been spearheading that, that effort, which has been truly co collaborative for every month for the last three years. We've been looking at these issues, knowing that indeed we do have challenges with gaps in our mental health system. I was a registered nurse for 27 years before I was elected to the council in 2009, and I worked for 22 years at OHSU in inpatient psychiatry. Dr. Bennington Davis pioneered changing use of force inside hospitals with her sanctuary model, which is now the standard of care throughout the United States. And similarly, that's what we're looking to do in our community. That's what we've been working on with all of our partners. And this settlement includes many of the things we've been working on. It also includes the work that the mayor and I have been working on with the Portland Plan and establishing the new Office of Equity and Human Rights. And we very intentionally are staffing the Human Rights Commission within the new Office of Equity and Human Rights. We're also staffing the Community and Police Relations Committee that is a subcommittee of the Human Rights Commission. And the mayor alluded to the training that is going to be happening and the training advisory committee. Three members of the Community and Police Relations Committee who've been working officers, community members, human rights commissioners for the last three years will be part of that training group. We're working on multiple different aspects, and I'm very pleased that the things that we have, through the Safe of the X project, realized should be done, now must be done. And the challenge will be to find out funding, but we know what should be done, and this statement of intent reflects that. We have a, a new computer-aided dispatch system <coughs> for emergency communications. It has far more capacity to, to be searchable, to enter data, to retrieve data quickly, and the tri triage desk, which Captain Sarah Westbrook and Director Lisa Turley have been working on regarding the Bureau of Emergency Communications and how we take those crisis calls and quickly determine who is the best provider to get to the scene and the background of the person who's in crisis. This coming Wednesday, we'll be announcing a new partnership with Lines for Life, Oregon Partnership, where we'll be publicizing a new number that people can call that's not 911, if they or a family member are in crisis, where they can talk with qualified mental health professionals and volunteers rather than calling for police or fire or medical dispatch. That we believe will be another option for citizens in our community where we do lack, the, there are some huge gaps in the mental health care system, as has been alluded to, which is a trickle down effect from the state. So this investigation in concert with the results of the state investigation should lead to a whole new way of taking care of people rather than not taking care of people, which will be most, both more compassionate and more cost effective. And finally, I'm very pleased to see the emphasis on community engagement and outreach. Both the Office of Neighborhood Involvement and the Office of Equity and Human Rights have been working diligently to make sure that everybody who is in Portland is welcome at the table, is represented at the table, and is part of these extremely important discussions. Thanks to everybody who's participating. Good morning. I'm going to keep my remarks uh, short. I want to thank the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, including Assistant Attorney General Thomas Perez and his staff, for working with us the past 14 months. And thank you also to Mayor Adams for his guidance and support throughout this process. Every day, Portland police officers are working to protect and serve our community. Last year, we had approximately 400,000 contacts with community members, and too many of these were the result of homelessness, addiction, and mental health issues. As a law enforcement agency over the last decade, we have had a dynamic shift from responding to criminal issues to responding to social disorder. Unfortunately, our system has given officers less options to help people who are afflicted with mental uh, health issues and sometimes concurrent drug and alcohol problems. We have not been adequately prepared for the changing circumstances in our community related to mental health. The situations we're talking about today are complex and difficult for officers to resolve. 
there are no easy answers or guaranteed outcomes. I believe that thoughtful people can respectfully disagree with the legal conclusions. However, we all agree that this Bureau and our community can improve the way we serve and protect Portland's most vulnerable populations. That's why, as the Department of Justice has provided us with recommendations during their investigation, this Bureau has already implemented changes in the way we investigate use of force, embarked on reducing unnecessary interactions with people in mental health crisis, and for having an inspector position that reviews all use of force incidents looking for trends or patterns that may be problematic. The, re the recommendations contained in this letter from the Department of Justice provide us with a foundation for additional enhancements that we believe are valuable ways to ensure that our use of force meets the community's expectations. I want to make it very clear, there is no daylight between what the Department of Justice is asking us to do and what we want to do as a Portland Police Bureau. As we move to implement these recommendations, we are fortunate to have close relationships with leaders in the mental health community, including Cascadia, which provides project respond workers who assist on many calls for service regarding people in crisis. Uh, Dr. Darrell Walker, CEO of Cascadia, is here today, and I want to personally thank him and his staff for the tremendous support they give police officers each and every day. If we are to be successful in meeting these challenges, then police officers will need to have better relationships with our social service partners than we do with jail staff. We all agree that we as a police department and as a community can do better. I am looking forward to a collaborative relationship with the Department of Justice and our social service partners as we make improvements that provide officers and our community more options and resources to effectively help people in a mental health crisis. Finally, what we're talking about today are processes and systems, not about our police officers. They, they took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States, and they're not the folks to blame. They are out in the community doing their very best, and in the majority of cases are highly successful, saving lives and making a positive difference. I support them and the work they do. The Portland Police Bureau continues to evolve, to learn and improve. I believe the resulting agreement from our efforts with the Department of Justice will make us a better, a better Portland Police Bureau. Thank you very much. With respect to questions, if you could please say who you'd like to ask and identify yourself. We'd like to start. I'll start. Yes. I'm Michelle Cole with the Oregonian, and I would like to ask um, Mr. Harris, I guess, a question uh, about the fact that we've talked a lot about local partnerships between your department and the Portland Police in the city of Portland, but I don't see anybody from the state standing here. And I was wondering, kind of, are they out of this kumbaya moment, or where, where do you stand with the state? Oh, we continue. Uh, we continue to work very collaboratively with the state on the broader systems issue of creating, as part of the governor's health care transformation, uh, a community-based a community mental health infrastructure across the state. Uh, we have been in contact with them. I know that the U.S. Attorney spoke with them as recently as last night, and uh, we continue uh, to stay in contact because we are on a parallel path strategy. Uh, we are working with the police department. Simultaneously, we're working with the state. It's one holistic, integrated network. That is really what we're trying to build here. And uh, I'm confident that we will continue to do that. And the state is a key uh, stakeholder in that regard. Um, over the next month, what do you expect to happen? You said you hope to complete the agreement in the next month and have a community group in place? Sure. Uh, what we expect to do in the next month, first and foremost, is a lot of listening. Uh, we did a lot of listening throughout our uh, investigation, and uh, as a result of that, I believe that uh, all the stakeholders will see that our findings reflect that listening, and uh, we will continue to listen and learn because we are uh, meeting with people uh, as soon as uh, later today. We've already met with senior leadership uh, in the department uh, because we want to get people's feedback about uh, the preliminary agreement that we've outlined. Uh, we have both a letter finding that is available for the public, as well as our uh, a two-page letter 
uh, that memorializes uh, the uh, concepts outlined in the preliminary agreement. And so we're going to reach out. And, and again, one of the things that was critically important for uh, all of us involved in this was that uh, there needs to be a structured uh, approach, uh, not simply in the next month, but in the improvement processes that lie ahead uh, in the months and years ahead uh, for uh, active and meaningful community engagement. And so we look forward to listening and learning and integrating uh, those suggestions into uh, the uh, agreement. Mayor, uh, what were your initial reactions to the findings of the investigation? Were you surprised? Is it what you were expecting? Either both, maybe? I'll be perfectly honest. As a police officer, it's um, uh, disappointing to hear that the Department of Justice believes that you haven't got it right. And uh, we uh, go out every day trying to do our very best in difficult circumstances and tough situations. And as I said, there's no easy answers or guaranteed outcomes. And it's, uh, it's just uh, hard to hear that you didn't get it right in some of those cases. But I think that our officers are committed to improving their uh, work with people in crisis. I know as uh, chief of police, it is one of the priorities that I have for this department. Erica? Yeah, um, first for Attorney General, you mentioned pensions between the police and communities of color. Why were there no formal findings with that? Should there be any policy changes with that issue? Well, again, uh, we had a number of, uh, I think, important and productive meetings uh, with uh, various communities here, and we will continue to do so. And uh, we, we believe that the structure of our preliminary agreement is going to provide opportunities to put many of these uh, festering tensions squarely on the table and provide an opportunity uh, to have uh, meaningful engagement, not simply on an ad hoc basis, but on a systemic basis so that uh, we can truly ensure that uh, everybody is part of the community. And, and I've observed there, there are a number of things that we observe that are being done. Uh, we've had conversations about hiring, for instance, and uh, we learned a lot about uh, efforts that have been made to ensure that there is a, uh, a very uh, robust outreach to various communities. And, and it is beginning uh, to bear fruit, uh, but we need more input from the community about how we can sustain that progress. And uh, I've seen this, this issue is not, uh, like the mental health uh, issue, this issue is not unique to Portland. Uh, and uh, it is vexing and challenging, but I have seen progress in this area. I have seen it in large cities like Los Angeles. I've seen it in, in mid-sized cities. I've seen it in smaller communities. And what it takes is sustained engagement. What it takes is uh, leaps of faith uh, to build uh, that trust. And uh, we've seen it work. And, uh, and I'm, I'm very confident here uh, that we'll uh, make progress in this area. It won't happen overnight. Uh, but uh, I, I, I've seen on the part of the community uh, a serious commitment, and I've seen in the part of uh, the leadership a serious commitment to really uh, improve and build additional bridges of, of trust and opportunity. You have a question right here, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm Sarah Mark, I'm with the Mercury, and I was wondering, are there you know, recommendations in this report, are there specific timelines spelled out for when those should be implemented, and what's the follow-up here? If we don't change, what's, what's next from, from your department? Well, I mean, we all have a shared interest in implementation as soon as possible. We do not want uh, a single uh, incident uh, that is a preventable incident to occur. And so that is why uh, we have a shared interest with the community and with uh, the department in making sure reforms are implemented as soon as possible. We also have to confront the reality that uh, reforms require resources. And so uh, in uh, agreements we've done with other cities, we have been very careful to uh, reflect uh, those fiscal realities and to uh, have stages of implementation. And uh, obviously, as we continue this discussion, we're simultaneously, as I mentioned earlier, talking uh, to the state. And uh, as the state reform process uh, continues, hopefully that will uh, enhance the efforts that are underway here. And, uh, and again, we will memorialize this in an agreement 
in, in a court enforceable agreement. And, and quite frankly, I'm, I'm quite confident that uh, uh, the agreement will uh, will be carried out. And uh, that's because I've, I've seen the resolve of the community here. I've seen the resolve of frontline officers. I've seen the resolve of the police leadership and the uh, political leadership in, in this city. Maybe a couple more questions. Yes, Christian. Well, this one for you, Chief Reese. <clears throat> Can you put us in the mind of a police officer who comes to the Hoyt Arboretum and somebody comes out of a bathroom with an exacto knife, how are they going to act differently? What's going to happen on the ground? What's going to go through that officer's mind after a, a, a finding like this? I don't want to talk about specific uh, cases, but I think that uh, what we're hoping as we move forward is that, uh, as, and we've been working on this with the Department of Justice uh, in the last year, on de-escalation strategies. So how do you realize that somebody is in a mental health crisis, which is hard to do. I, mean, it, it, I think experts in that field would say it, it's really tough you know, as you're arriving on scene to figure that out. But if we have that information uh, available, how do we use de-escalation strategies? How do we use other uh, tactics or resources that may be available? And uh, fundamentally, I think we have to treat people in mental health crisis with compassion and empathy, we can't treat them the same way we do somebody that's committed a bank robbery. And uh, while people in crisis can be dangerous and unpredictable, we have to uh, treat them with compassion and empathy while protecting ourselves in the community. So your question raises uh, an issue that I have observed elsewhere in the country where, where uh, it's an, an understandable question and then the question is, well, will the frontline officer respond to our findings by simply staying in his or her car and avoiding uh, situations where you interact with the public. Uh, the term of art in uh, uh, policing is uh, will they engage in de-policing? Well, the evidence um, has been quite the contrary. You look at places like Los Angeles where we were able to work collaboratively with the police leadership there and uh, on an array of issues that are far wider in breadth than the issues that we see here. Uh, there have been study after study after study that demonstrates uh, just the opposite. Uh, what happened in the agreements that we reached with Los Angeles is that we gave officers more tools so they could do their job better. So in fact, uh, policing was more effective, use of force was down, public confidence was up, and it was up across all racial uh, demographics. And uh, as a result, uh, what I hope and what I've attempted to communicate uh, directly with uh, frontline officers is our goal here is to give you more tools. And when you have more tools, you can be a more effective problem solver. Police officers are problem solvers. And as a result of many of the deficiencies that the chief has outlined, we're asking them to solve some really vexing challenges that are um, frankly unfair in many contexts to ask them to solve. But we're going to give them more resources. And when we do that, and you have more tools in your arsenal, you become a better problem solver. Dennis, I know you had a question. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, there's a citizen aspect of this. If you want people to come together and talk about this, there are community groups now who have raised questions about how transparent a training advisory council is going to be. Is that something you're going to be working with to make sure that that is going to be addressed, those concerns, so people feel like they can communicate? Yeah, the, uh, the training advisory council that goes along with the new uh, consolidated um, training activities, training programs, officer training programs for the Bureau, the new training center. Um, the, the proceedings of that advisory council will both be uh, open door, uh, but I also want them to be exposed to every scenario training possibility. And some of those scenarios need to be closed door, executive session. Uh, there are folks in the community who have criminal intentions, who do not suffer from mental health, and I don't want to give away the playbook, but it'll be both public and private, and uh, I think um, it'll be of great value to both the community in giving us good feedback, and I think it'll be of great value to the, to the police force. That concludes today's press conference, but of course each person here remains for individual interviews. I want to thank all of you very much for coming. Yeah, no, <laughs>